those child dedications. Oh, man. I love these kids. I love these kids. Welcome to Common Ground Church, if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet. Uh, my name is Matt McDonald. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, we are a church. We love us some Jesus. Uh, we love us some people. And so anytime we get to worship Jesus with some people, uh, it is a win. It is a good day. Think about it. You could be doing anything else, but you're here right now in the presence of God because he has a word for you. Um, how many of you, I don't know if anybody, has anybody been back to the movie theater? Has anybody been to a theater before COVID? Okay, okay, cool. So you don't get all antsy towards the end of a movie, so I'm going to ask you, as we go through the service, don't get all antsy and try to leave. You can handle it, I promise. We can handle it. We can do it if we do it together. Amen? So about six or seven of you are like, okay, the other you're like, okay, let's see, white boy. Let's just kind of... Get, get on with it. <laughs> hey, we are, in a, we are in a series we've been calling Power Up. Yeah. Power Up, learning to live in the power uh, of the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, like I said, if you're a guest with us, we are excited you're here uh, into this series. Um, I just want to mention real quick before we get too much into it that tomorrow morning, uh, a group of our kids and their leaders are leaving for kids camp. Woo! Yes. Pray for them. Pray for them. The leaders especially. Pray for them as they go to kids camp. Uh, but we don't believe that there is a junior version of God. We don't believe that there is a kid version of the Holy Spirit. We believe that it's the same God. And so our kids heading to camp, uh, they're going to do all kinds of amazing things. There's going to be rec time. There's going to be worship time. There's going to be a word for all. It's, it's amazing time. So pray for our kids heading out. Pray for our leaders, Jackie and the team heading out tomorrow morning at 1030. At 10.30, they're leaving from here. So if you want to come and pray for them and send them off with a big shout, come at like 10.15 to the parking lot tomorrow so we can send them off. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, like I said, we are in Power Up. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Uh, as you do that, just a real quick recap. Last week I told you um, this series power up, and I gave you this Mario illustration that my son, he's playing this Mario game, and how I told him at the beginning, it's vital for him to get that first box, because that first box is the mushroom where he, you know, powers up, <laughs> and that kind of sets him up for the flower, that kind of sets him up for all kinds of other things, and so the Holy Spirit is our helper. He is our advocate. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us and convicts us of truth. And, and all this. So it's important that we learn to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. But unfortunately, there's been some misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. Right? Weird. <laughs> Holy Spirit's weird when you do that. You're going to start tongue-talking? Is that what we're... You're going to start teaching me to how to tie my bow tie? The shoot about a Honda. Is that where we're? Is that where we're getting it? Right. There's some misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. Is that He makes you weird? Um, but the good news is you're already weird. Like I'm already weird. Um, the Holy Spirit is not our weird helper. He's just our helper. The Holy Spirit empowers us, equips us, and sustains us to live the life that He's called us to live. And the Holy Spirit is our benefit. The the Holy Spirit is not uh, you know in third place in the Trinity. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, a triune God. And he's not the one we mumble past because we're uncomfortable with him. You know, when we baptize, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come back on up. There we go. We got past it without anything going too weird. But he's not weird, but people have made him weird. There's two, two of the biggest reasons for misconception or misunderstanding when it comes to the Holy Spirit is abuse and neglect. Abuse, you know, you've seen the... TV televangelists who push people over and fall off stage. Did anybody see that movie Faith with Steve Martin? It's probably not a good one. Don't, don't, don't see it. Don't tell him I told you to go watch it. Uh, <laughs> but there's been, right, there's abuse, right? The, the snake wrangling, tongue talking, weird. They're going to push me over. I'm going to fall out of my chair. Holy Spirit. And then there's neglect. Like, we don't talk anything about the Holy Spirit. We get saved, we're done, we're on our way, we're, we're good to go. So abuse and neglect are kind of the biggest misconceptions around the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing, once you realize how vital the Holy Spirit is in your life, it's no wonder why Satan has done so much to try to distort the truth around the Holy Spirit. So much so that not only is there confusion in and out of the church, there's a whole bunch of confusion and division within the church about who the Holy Spirit is, what he does. And so I told you last week 
Um, I don't know if you guys uh, have the internet. Um, <laughs> there's this meme on the internet of this guy holding this cardboard sign, just trying to get people to do stuff. And so I made my own, we said last week, we want to normalize the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Not in a way that makes him common, in, in terms of on our level, like he's not a holy God, but in a way that is normal for Christians to have an active relationship with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit is the one that's speaking to us. So we're going to normalize the Holy Spirit. And hot feet. Everybody only talks about cold feet. My feet get hot all the time, and no one's talking about it. I'm here to talk about it. My feet get hot, and I have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Another kind of misconception I think we have about the Holy Spirit is we, um, you know, old school ghosts. We, old school church, we use the Holy Ghost. And then, like, our interpretation and our culturalization, is that a word? Culturalization uh, of the word ghost, we're like, holy ghost, Ugh. I don't like ghosts. <laughs> ghosts are weird, ghosts are those things in Mario, you look at them, they stop moving, you can't turn around, you look at them, <laughs> don't, don't. And, and so we have all these, so what we're here to do if throughout this series is to break down the barriers um, between us and the Holy Spirit and see that when we know that we're created, and especially when we're saved, we have this, this, this amazing person in the Holy Spirit to sustain us on our journey. We don't want to let the enemy get a foothold in our life to say, no, 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 you know what, they, they, he's weird, you don't need him. Just keep trying to do it on your own strength. Just keep doing you. You just keep doing the best you can. Go to church on Sunday, say a prayer, put a little five spot in the offering plate when it goes around or one of the black boxes when you leave the church, and you're good. Do one good thing a day, and you're, this is the Holy Spirit. Just keep trying on yourself. But we need the Holy Spirit. So last week we talked about who is the Holy Spirit. If you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to it because we learned the Holy Spirit is not a thing or an it. He's a person. He's not a presence to be feared, but a person to be known. He's part of the Trinity, he's God, and he's a person. And I asked you, I gave you homework last week. Don't you love this church? You come and get homework even in the summertime, you're welcome. Uh, to, to read John chapters 14, 15, and 16 in the first few chapters of Acts. Because uh, today we're going to be talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I would imagine as soon as I said that, depending on where you stand, depending on your upbringing, depending on anything, you, your mind went somewhere. Your mind went like, oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Or your mind went, nope, done with this message. I, I wanna encourage you, lean into what God has to say to you uh, this morning. Lean into what God has for you because you're not here by mistake. You're here for a reason. So Acts chapter eight, where I ask you to turn, we're gonna start in verse 14 and just a little bit of catch up to get us to this point in the book of Acts. Stephen, which is the church's first martyr, just stoned to death. And Saul, we know him as Paul, was, was there watching and approving of it. So he was, he was stoned to death. He was martyred. The believers, except the apostles, all of the other believers were spread out and scattered in a whole bunch of places. There was some weird sorcery going on um, by this guy named Simon. And, he was, and people were convinced that, like, oh, my gosh, I think that, that's, that might be God. Simon, this guy Simon. But Simon, Scripture tells us, was a sorcerer. Sorcery. And, and it's interesting that we have that right along with the coming and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit all throughout. And there, so especially then there was a lot of like, okay, so that must be what the Holy Spirit does, all this weird stuff? I don't think so. But Simon was a sorcery, sorcerist. Uh, is that a word? Sorcerist. Sorcerer. Nailed it. Nailed it. Sorcerer. I dropped out of college. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we have Simon the sorcerer uh, going around, and he's convincing all these people um, that there, there, there might be another way other than Jesus to God the Father. And so people kind of start buying into it. But then we see some of the other believers, Philip is one of them, they start preaching the truth, the message of the way, the message of Jesus, the message of Jesus on the cross, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. And then so people start now like, wait a second, that sounds more true. So people start believing the gospel over what Simon the sorcerer was trying to peddle them. And then we pick up in Acts chapter 8, verse 14. And it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, 
They sent Peter and John there. Remember, they're believing it now in place of what Simon the sorcerer. I like that word better. It's fun. <laughs> Simon the sorcerer was telling them. So it said, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers. Say new believers. New believers. To receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet, say not yet. not yet. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received, say received. received. They received the Holy Spirit. I want to speak just for the next few moments we have together, um, a message that I'm calling Immaculate Reception. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you that everything you have for us is for our good and for our benefit. God, I pray that we would lean in to what you want to speak to us this morning, God, that, that hardened hearts would be softened, that closed minds would be open, that closed eyes would be open to what you want to say this morning. God, I pray that you anoint my heart, my lips, to speak the truth of your word, Father, not my opinion, not my perspective, uh, not what I'm comfortable with or what I'm used to, God, but to speak your truth in love. It's in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. 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 Let's God some praise in this place this morning. So I got a question. Anybody ever been in a place where you had poor reception? Uh, Paseo, for instance. Uh, I drop every call I'm ever on every time I drive down Paseo, with, without a doubt. But my mind kind of goes, when I think of poor reception, I think of like dead zones, we call them, right? Um, but I also think about, you know, Michael Scott out in the woods, survivor man. <laughs> and you know, when you have bad reception in the woods, what's the first thing everybody does? Can I get, okay, let me get to higher ground. Let me kind of, and so I have this picture of my head with people with poor reception. That's kind of what they're doing. They're walking around like, where can I get these bars? Do I go to the sky? Do I need to get a height of that mountain? Uh, and, and usually you, the reason for poor reception is the distance between where you're at and the source that gives the signal, uh, the cell tower. That's, that's what happens when you're far away from the source of reception. Or if you don't know where the source is, you kind of just kind of walk around meaningless and, and wondering and wandering around like, okay, where can I get this? But our first, like when you're in the woods especially, your first thing is to go, okay, let me get to higher ground. If I can get to higher ground, because typically higher ground will help you get maybe close to a signal source, correct? But the thing is, it's not necessarily the height, it's the line of sight that disconnects you reception-wise from the source. So while going to higher ground more often than not would work because you'll clear what's around you, it's a misconception that going to higher ground is actually what gets you closer to the signal source. Going to higher ground for a signal source is kind of like coming to church to get close to God. Like, it'll probably get you there. You probably will. But that's not what has your relationship with God for you. It's, it's you drawing near to the Lord also Monday through Saturday and Sunday afternoon. We don't just come to church to get close to God. We come to church because we're commanded in Scripture to do not forsake the fellowship of the believers. And because there's power, say power. There's power when we're together, when we're worshiping together. But make no mistake about it, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> I, I, my son tried it. He sat down on the floor. Dad, I'm Bucky. That's what we call our van. I said, no, you're not, son. You're just where he's parked, usually. But going to higher ground is the misconception that gets us there. It'll probably work. And, and for our topic today, poor reception, when it comes to receiving and living in the power of the Holy Spirit, it does come from being too far from the source. Become, be, from being too far away from the source, from the giver but also can come from simply being misinformed or unaware where the source is, or better yet, who the source is. So in order for us to experience this immaculate reception, we need to make sure we do two things. One, learn where the source is. Like, where does the Holy Spirit come from? What is the Holy Spirit's role in our lives? And two, place ourselves in close proximity to the source, amen? 
So we're going to talk about something, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago on Pentecost Sunday when we were uh, talking about Acts chapter 2. Uh, there's, a, there's a book by Pastor Robert Morris from Gateway Church in Dallas, Texas called The God I Never Knew. Um, Highly recommend it. Check it out. Read it. It gives a lot of insight on who the Holy Spirit is, his role uh, in our lives. And today I'm going to be drawing off a little bit of that insight, uh, but most importantly, insight from the Word of God. Amen? Amen? And just know if you have a problem with it, it's not me, it's the Bible. I'm just preaching the Bible from the Word. So we're going to talk about something called the three baptisms today. Say three baptisms. Now, when you hear that, you might be like, what? Sean was just talking about water baptism. There's, there's two more. I just got used to the fact that there's a baptism with the Holy Spirit. There, you know, you're telling me there's three? There is three, and it's actually all in Scripture. So what I'm going to do is my handy-dandy friend over here, the whiteboard. Yeah. Guys, this makes me a better preacher, this whiteboard. <laughs> we're going to talk about the three baptisms today. The three baptisms. The first one we're going to talk about is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It says this, some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. Indication, a lot of different type of folk here. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. The first baptism I want to talk to you about this morning is the baptism of, say of, of. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what we read here in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It's, in, in other words, it's salvation. It's the moment you surrender your life to Jesus. And, and the first baptism, it, it happens only by Jesus' work on the cross. Yeah. We call it saved, terms for its role in John chapter 14. And we read more about it in 15 or 16. So the baptism of, say of again, oh. baptism of the Holy Spirit is Jesus' work on the cross. It saves you, baptizing you into the family of God. Let me draw a little fun little family down here. Nice dresses. There we go. There's people. I'm not a good drawer, so I'm going to need you to not make fun of me when I draw. It's, it hurts my feelings. So the, the first baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts you of your sin, convincing you that you need a Savior, into the family, say family, family, the family of God, because there's a lot of people who have a lot of problems with a lot of churches that think they don't need church to be a Christian. <clears throat> no, I don't need that. I'll just be a Christian on my own. Okay, see how that goes. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole New Testament that talks about the model and the need for church community and spiritual family and spiritual leaders, but usually that belief comes from church hurt. A bad experience in church. Oh, I had a bad pastor who was mean to me. I had a bad elder. He did this to me. Oh, I had this leader. She was just ridiculous. Oh, my goodness. I, no. So I decided instead of going to church, instead of being a part of a church, I'm going to be the church. And then we misconstrue this saying, well, the church isn't the building. It's the people. Yeah, when we're together. <laughs> We can't just separate ourselves from the church and think we're going to be fine. You know what typically, this isn't even in my notes, I'm so sorry. Uh, not sorry, actually. Typically, the reason we don't want to be a part of a church if we're a Christian is, is one, like I mentioned, church hurt, or two, we don't want anybody up in our business. We don't want anybody asking us what we're doing and anybody to tell us to stop doing what we're doing because we're going to feel judged. We're going to feel judged. But here's the thing, God is not looking to get you into church so that people can judge you. He's looking to get you in church because there's power in community for you to actually live out who he's called you to be. And yes, it's gonna come with some uncomfortable conversations like why are you being a dummy? <clears throat> not so anybody can think they're better than you, but so somebody can, God is trying to get the best out of you. So if you feel judged by another person and you probably have a good argument that they're judging you, blah, blah, who cares? It's not about them. Get into church. It says those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. So get yourself planted because when you said yes to Jesus and you surrendered your life to him, you know what you were also doing? You were saying yes to being part of the church. It's the terms and conditions. You should have checked. You, <laughs> you just check the box and you just want, 
You, you were baptized into the family of God. You were baptized into the body of Christ. Many parts, one body. You remember the hand? Do we got the hand anywhere? Is the hand in the drum cage over here? I think the hand's over here. To the left. You guys want me to play some drums? Back towards the front, he said. Oh, there it is. Yeah! <laughs> you thought this was the only visuals. We got hidden visuals. We got hidden visuals. I used this a couple months ago, and then I've been hiding it in different places in the church since then. <laughs> it's not a real hand, don't worry. It's, I got it from Sally's Beauty Supply. Um, <clears throat> I need a new blow dryer. <laughs> you think this just happens? It's... So this is us when we refuse to be a part of the body. A hand is not very effective in this jar or cut off from the body. And you know what? The body's hurting too. But the body is kind of like a lizard in the sense that it is not dependent upon you to continue to go forth. But if you are a part of a church, this church, you need to be connected to the body. Connected to the body is more than coming on Sundays and receiving. I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm in a season of receiving. I just need to receive today. No. <laughs> right? Scripture said it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's amazing what God will work out in your life as you actually serve and as you actually give versus taking a step back because it's too much right now and I'm just not going to until God works this thing out in my life. God knew what he was doing when he made you a part of the body. You gotta be a part of the body to actually work that thing out in your life. No, that doesn't look like always serving every Sunday, but if you're not serving every Sunday because you're like, oh, they're just using me. Y yeah. <laughs> We are. You remember when you prayed, God, use me. God, use me. And then we get all bent out of shape. They're just using me. You prayed for it. Don't be a hand in a jar. Put this over here. Scare Tim later. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit that convicted you of your need of a Savior, and he is the one that baptizes you into the family of God. We call this salvation. Sorry, I bad, bad handwriting too. The second baptism is the one we talked about that's coming up here in a couple weeks that we're doing is water baptism. Water baptism. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, water baptism doesn't save you, but it does symbolize your faith and is an important step in your faith. Yeah. Jesus was water baptized. If nothing else, why do we get water baptized? Because Jesus was. And it's also symbolic of our faith. It's a symbolic celebration and a solidified commitment. We're being water baptized. It's symbolic of death, burial, and resurrection. So this, let's see. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that's the tomb. And then that's the stone in front of the tomb rolling away. Could have been an artist. It's no big deal. <laughs> So it's symbolic of our death, burial, resurrection, and it's water baptism because John baptized with water, but he said, another is coming after me whose sandals I'm not even worthy to lace up. It's like anybody coming after Jordan. <laughs> There's some blind witnesses in our church. I don't know think LeBron is something. But anyways, <clears throat> it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's a symbolic celebration of the old you being washed away and the new you being raised to life. <clears throat> That's why our shirts, our baptism shirts, say raised to life. And we baptize people in them because that's what it is symbolic of. Now, <clears throat> here's what water ba baptism, if you've ever thought like it's just the thing you do or it's just, you know, sprinkling the water on the baby, I kind of envision it being like that. 
But we, we said earlier, we don't do infant baptisms here because we believe that scripture teaches baptism is a step of faith once you have surrendered your life to Jesus. Last time I checked, a baby can't even choose to hold their head up much less give their life to Jesus. Um, and so that's why we wait until someone has experienced this before they get water baptized. Um, but it's symbolic here. There's four things I wanna give you that it, it symbolizes. Burial and resurrection, right? It's the old life being buried, new life being raised to Christ. That's what our t-shirts say. It's what Paul talks about in the New Testament. Um, there's symbolism in the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Right, you think about when the Israelites came to the Red Sea and it was bam, there, and then all of a sudden, bam, it wasn't there. Right, they were slaves in Egypt. We were slaves to sin, and now we're being led by God into new life and being raised to life. There's, it's, it's amazing how scripture confirms itself over and over and over again. It's symbolic of circumcision. Thank God that may not be a requirement anymore but it's still something you can choose to do. But it was symbolic of what they were doing. So cutting away the flesh, cutting away our sin nature, being raised to new life in Christ. And it's symbolic of the flood. Noah built the ark, right? It's the removal of dirt for the survivors because not everybody survived. But this removal of the dirt for the survivors by water, it's the removal of the penalty of sin because what Jesus did on the cross for us and because the tomb that he came out of because he wasn't dead, he raised on the third day and ascended into heaven. So we get water baptized as a symbol of our faith, as an outward symbol of an inward faith. It's water baptism. So that's two. The third one I want to talk about is the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. The baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. What's, what's amazing is, is after Jesus was resurrected, right, then he ascended into heaven. And we, we talked a little bit about last week when he told his disciples, it's better if I leave. Because if I don't, the helper won't come. But when I leave, I will send you the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 17 says this. This is Jesus is teaching his disciples about the Holy Spirit. He said, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you. He lives with you now and later will be in you. So Acts chapter two, we talked about last week. I'm going to try to draw. Braden was teaching me. It's fire. It's, it's. Oh, that one's a little bubbly. So it's the Holy Spirit now coming down. <clears throat> The Holy Spirit, right? Acts chapter 2 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. John chapter 14, Jesus was already saying what was going to happen. He said, because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Now, it's important when reading scripture. Believe it or not, the authors of scripture didn't speak English. It's true. You can look. So it's, it's been translated. Now, does that mean our English versions aren't reliable? No, that's not at all what that means. What it means is it's important for us as Christ followers to make sure we're letting the word be our guide and not our feelings, not our thought, and let the word be our guide. And when you study the word, it begins, God begins to reveal himself to you in such a real and tangible way. But sometimes our English literalism works against us. Right, because it's like, wait a second, he said because he lives with you. Can we put, yeah, good, good, good. Because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Now the thing is, is when we get saved, when we surrender our life to Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. It's called regeneration. It's called being born again, however you want to phrase it. We have the Holy Spirit living in us the moment we say yes to Jesus and surrender our lives. Romans 10, 9 says, when you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So right here, bam, you're going to heaven. The problem is a lot of Christians get saved and then just wait for heaven. Like we got our get out of hell free card, so I'm just going to do me for the rest of the time I'm here. <clears throat> this will get you eternity in heaven. 
Th that's what we're talking about before we, we get all weird and kind of confused. But what Jesus is talking about, because he lives with you, later he will be in you. What is he talking about? Well, let's break down those words, with. That word, with. It's, it's the Greek word para or para. I say para because I'm New Mexico, so. It, be, it means with, by, or beside. The biblical sense of this word, get this, is that of a relative. A person related by blood or marriage. He lives with you now, related by blood. A relative, because you have now been baptized into the family of God. He's with you now. The Holy Spirit lives with you now. But later, he will be in you. That word in means among, in or on. Biblical sense of the word, get this, is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So it's not weird, it's Bible. The problem is we've seen too much TV. <laughs> the problem is, is we've known too many weird people, too many snake wranglers that think, bite me, the Holy Spirit will save me. Okay, go ahead, I'm gonna stay back here not let that snake bite me. <laughs> it's to be baptized in or with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit lives with you now. You've received salvation. And later the Holy Spirit will be in you. You will be baptized with or baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. Not anybody's prayer or anybody's pushing you <laughs> to make you fall over. Not anybody grabbing your tummy to make you say, come on, come on, shoot about us, shut up, come on, get it out. Because here's the thing, we're gonna do a whole message about tongues in a couple weeks, the difference between praying in tongues and speaking in tongues, and what that actually means, and how you can't be taught to pray in tongues. Why, because it's, it's Jesus who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. So we're, we're gonna get into all that here in a couple weeks and kinda clarify some things, maybe you've had some weird experiences. But it's Jesus who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. So it's Jesus who we ask to baptize us with the Holy yes. Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've been looking at this stuff over here wondering, what's he gonna do? So here's the thing, this is little OU. This is Bobo. <laughs> Bob and Dan are two of our elders here, by the way, and they give each other the hardest time of anybody. And so I just have to say Bob, and Dan starts laughing. <laughs> Our elder meetings are a hoot, by the way. So this is you. This is you before you met Jesus. I don't know Jesus. I'm just an empty glass. Maybe plastic, if you're savvy. But this is you. When you surrender your life to Jesus, you receive salvation. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. Empty lives being filled with the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit. So you're not empty anymore. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, convicting you of all truth, leading you into all righteousness, and filling you. So you have the Holy Spirit living in you the moment you give your life to Jesus. And then you get water baptized to celebrate that, to, to symbolize that, an outward expression of an inward faith. But there's something else that Jesus is talking about. Can we put John 14, 17 back up there? He says, because the Holy Spirit lives with you now. Now, I know I said in, and we say in you later. But remember, we just looked at those words. Let's not limit it to our English language. Lives with you now. Why? Because he's the one that convicted you of your sin and saves you. But Jesus says, later, he will be in you. Acts 1 says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the difference between receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit and le learning to live in the power of the Holy Spirit and salvation when the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us, this is our ticket to heaven. We're good. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will receive power and you will be, the, ho the presence of the Holy will be poured out upon you and you will live in that, you will move in that, you will breathe in that and you will operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, amen? It's not weird. He's not here to make you weird. He's not here to make you do weird things. He's here to equip you to live the life that you were called to live, amen? As we get ready to, to close, I wanna share some things. We're gonna tear all this down, by the way, so do your best to kind of keep your shh, shh. 
eyes on me. I'm going to call the band. You guys going back up. We can tear this stuff down. <clears throat> but this picture is what I want to leave you with. I'm going to hold it. This is you surrendering your life to Jesus. Like, okay, but anybody ever realize how hard it is to be a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> it's real hard. Dare I say impossible in the world that we live in because we can't do it on our own strength. We can't do it on our own power. We can't do it without the baptism and the Holy Spirit. We're gonna keep trying and fail. We're gonna keep trying, trying, trying and fail. And next week we're gonna talk about spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, Paul talks about the different spiritual gifts that the Spirit gives, not that people train you to do and be weird, <laughs> but that the Holy Spirit gives. And receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit is not weird and it is not as dramatic as sometimes you think it is or as you see on TV. I'm gonna give this. It actually should be the norm among Christ followers. You know, I, uh, I had a big time mental block when it came to receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit for a long, long time. I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about who the Holy Spirit was, his role in my life. Growing up, I, like, I heard a lot about Jesus, which Jesus is who saves us, <laughs> but there was never this third person of the Trinity that the Bible talks about, the Holy Spirit. And so I had this misconception because of what I'd seen on TV and because of weird experiences that the Holy Spirit was, mm -mm. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mm -mm, no, none of that. No, no, we, Jesus is all we need when it comes to living the life he's, but again, he's a triune God. So when you say no to the Holy Spirit, you can't say no to the Holy Spirit and yes to the rest of the Trinity. <laughs> he's a triune God. And so I remember vividly this journey I began to go on um, about who the Holy Spirit is and what he wanted for my life and how his presence and relationship with him would change my life. But you know what kept tripping me up, DJ? Was tongues. I didn't, I didn't buy it. I'm, I'm a skeptical person at heart anyways. And so I kept hearing about this thing called tongues. And again, two weeks, make sure you come back. We're gonna talk about the difference between praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, and what God does. not But that's the thing that kept tripping me up because I'm like, everybody's saying the same thing. Everybody sounds the same. It's all this shit about a hala. Shandai. There's a Shandai in there too. I think there is a Hadouken. <laughs> like what? This is, I, I, I didn't buy it. I was like, no, I, I, I don't think so. And then I, I began to process two questions in my life. One, Pastor JR, my pastor, our founding pastor, preached a message years ago. Me and my wife talked about it the other day. He said this thing. He said, you can't put God in a box. And so that has always helped me in terms of what God wants in my life. The two questions that really grappled me that I began to wrestle with that I want to encourage you with is one, and I, I feel like God was asking me these questions directly. Do I really think I'll ever be at a point where I understand enough about God to be comfortable with everything he wants to do in my life? Do, do I really believe I'll get to a point where intellectually, mentally, I will understand enough about God to be comfortable with what he wants to do in my life. Because I still don't understand the Trinity. This whole three gods in one? Are you telling me it's one? Yeah, but it's three. But, so it's three. No, he's one God. But it's three, yes. If you try to intellectually grasp that, right? We talk about A.W. Tozer and what he said, you can't intellectually grasp a spiritual truth because it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us. So do I really think I can understand enough about God to be comfortable with everything he wants to do in my life? And number two was this, and this is the one that really gripped me. Am I embarrassed? Am I embarrassed by God? Am I embarrassed enough to where I'm not gonna be able to explain well enough to my family, to my friends, to anybody that believed different than, than what I was exploring about the Holy Spirit? Am I embarrassed enough to stop exploring what God wants for my life? And am I good with how things are right now? Those two questions I wrestled with for, for a long, long time. I remember praying like, Lord, Jesus, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. I 
don't see any tongues of fire. I don't, nothing's weird. What's, again, I had this picture in my head. You know, there, there's only, there, there's really two really dramatic moments of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. One is Saul when he was on the road to Damascus and he became Paul. He got blinded. Ah, can't see. And another one was Peter on the rooftop and he said when he saw a sheet as if it was let down from heaven. Those are two pretty dramatic moments that people had with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. The rest of it, you know what? It's pretty normal. It's pretty, pretty average. Nobody fell. And again, not putting God in a box. It's not saying that we can fully stop and encapsulate the expression of God. But when we see people fall, usually our mind goes like, oh, faker. Hey, if God wants to move, who are we to stop him from moving? But it doesn't have to be that. Where it happened for me was right back there in that sound booth. I remember we were going into something called Deeper Weekend and we had a guy coming into town, Pastor Jim Critcher. Uh, if you were here, if you remember him, he did a, a seminar on the Holy Spirit. And I remember kind of earmarking that date on my calendar saying, okay, God, come on, let's do something there. <laughs> because I had been praying, I didn't, nothing was happening. My mind was such a mental blockade from receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit that I kept thinking that in order to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I had to be in a trance. Like my mind couldn't be cognizant of what was actually going on. So I kept thinking, I'm like, well, if I'm thinking it, then it can't happen because that's not. And so I was in an effort to not put God in a box. I was putting them in a smaller one, <laughs> thinking this is what it must look like. And so I remember praying. I wish I should have sent the picture. I, I found this prayer the other day. It was from June or July 19th, 2013 at 1.30 in the afternoon. I wrote this prayer down. I said, God, I want everything you have for me. I want to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I want to pray in tongues. I want the gift of prophecy. I want the gift of all of these things, God, that you say your word, but don't let me stop it. Don't let me be weird about it. I don't want it just to say I have it. I want it, God, because I want what you have for me. I don't want it to say I have it. I want it so that I can be closer to you, so that I can grow closer to you and walk in who you've created me to be. And so I wrote that prayer down going into Deeper Weekend. I fasted. I was like, okay, I'm serious about this. God, come on, let's go. And I remember going through the Holy Spirit seminar and nothing happened. I'm like, ah. and so I remember going back in that sound booth. I was like, God, I don't want my mind to stop me from what you have for me. And I remember being right back there and I didn't fall over. There was nobody else in here. It wasn't super dramatic, but I remember receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit and I began to pray and glorify God. And that was it. And I've been doing my best to do that ever since. It, sometimes we'll get to a point where we feel dry, where we feel empty, and that's when we say things, you probably heard it pray, like, God, give us a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Fill me again, Father. That's not saying, let me get saved again because I've been sinning so much, I lost my salvation. That's, that's not what that prayer is. It's God, fill me again with your presence. Surround me again with your presence. Lead me into all truth and righteousness. So that's my prayer for us this morning. We're gonna go into a, another song of worship, and again, like I told you, we sit through movies all the time. I want to encourage you not to get too antsy and try to run out of here. We're going to take the next five, 10 minutes and just worship and we're going to pray. So if you would, I want you to, uh, to stand to your feet as we get ready to worship. There's going to be some folks that come up to the front um, to pray with you if you want to, but I want to encourage you right there in your seat. Just have a moment, you and God. And remember, it's Jesus who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. Ask Jesus, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. If you want someone to pray with you, that prayer just to encourage you, come on up. We have people here to pray. They're not gonna preach to you, I promise. They're not gonna ask you about your tithing record. They're not gonna, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a moment where they're gonna call out all the sin in your life. It's a moment where we're gonna have people here to pray for you. And all they're gonna pray is Jesus baptize them with your Holy Spirit and just sit there and pray with you and let God do the work. Amen. Sean, Amy, you guys come up, there's some room all around this place. So I wanna encourage you, worship where you're at. If you need prayer, come up to the front.
And let's ask Jesus to simply do what Jesus does and take the lead in our lives. Amen? Don't stand by. Don't get caught watching church this morning. Let's experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen?